so welcome uh, everyone to the, the the last day of talks of this workshop. Uh, so uh, we'll kick off the last day with LS Yuan, uh, and uh, he'll give us a talk on the celestial sphere, uh, celestial OPE, and scattering amplitude. So welcome, LS, and take take over. Oh, thanks, your team. So I begin. Uh, I guess uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so uh, it, it's a, a great honor for me to to be invited to this fancy, fantastic workshop and. Uh, share with you some recent work that I did. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about something uh, which I guess has already, uh, some people have already, participants have already talked about uh, related to this object, uh, subject. And my talk title is Celestial OPE in Scattering Amplitudes. Uh, or in other words, I'm going to study the OPE uh, between celestial operators. Uh, which come arise from the a certain transformation of the ordinary scattering amplitude that we talk about. Uh, to start with, let me uh, again uh, begin with a little bit of motivation. So the motivation for me is to look for a certain kind of holography. And when we talk about holography, the the usual uh, thing that enter into mind is the holography between the some uh, quantum gravity in AD asymptotic ADS spacetime and uh, a certain CFT theory on living on its boundary. Uh, this is uh, something that people have been already working on and study uh, for quite many years. And uh, now we at least have uh, many uh, well-established examples. Uh, so here, the, uh, some of the features here, uh, let me reveal a little bit. Uh, so, so first of all, about the boundary of this uh, space-time, we all know that this boundary looks like some flat space, uh, flat space time, and in particular, it has, it has a time direction. And uh, so we are in here, we're going to use uh, some more, a little bit more well-established theory uh, with one less space, spatial, living in a space with one less, spa spa one less spatial direction to describe something that we are less familiar with in one higher dimension. And uh, one of the uh, main motivation uh, for this kind of picture is actually from the symmetries. And we, it's well known that the asymmetry of the ADS space-time is exactly the same as the conformal symmetry of its boundary. So this is one of the main motivation that leads people to think about this idea. And uh, on the other hand, when we study this holography, uh, one of the uh, typical observables observables that we uh, frequently talk about is the so-called boundary correlators. Or in other words, we insert co operators, various operators on the boundary and uh, study their correlation. And on one hand, we can use the bulk uh, theory to compute uh, the, uh, their correlation. And there we think about that these operators excite some states that propagate into the bulk and interact. And on the other hand, we can as well study this boundary correlators purely from the CFT side, and the two sides has to match. So this is a Euro story. But now I would like to uh, switch a little bit and uh, think, for, think about whether there should, could exist similar holography story, uh, but for this time for physics in the asymptotically Minkowski space time. So this is, should be much more interesting because we, well, in a good approximation, we all live in the, um, in cold case space time, right? But here, the, already the space time structure is quite different. When we look at the boundary, the boundary is greatly different. In particular, the, the Minkowski space time has a null boundary, uh, which has the topological structure like R cross S2, if we think about four dimensions. And in particular, here, there's no time direction. This R is some certain null direction when we look at the space time metric. And this S2 is what we usually call the celestial sphere because it's exactly in correspondence, with, in correspondence to what we usually see when we look into the sky. And here, when, we, when it comes to the symmetries, there's also, nevertheless, also a, a nice correspondence between the bulk symmetry and the boundary symmetry. So on one hand, we, it, it's well known that the Minkowski space time uh, enjoys the Lorentz symmetry, which in four dimensions is the SO3,1. But on the other hand, we could also think about this SO3,1 
as a conformal symmetry naturally tied to the celestial sphere that I was talking about. Yeah, so here the symmetry is the, the, the correspondence between the symmetries is the, is the correspondence between 4D and 2D. <clears throat> uh, and next, uh, when we look at, when we try to study the various observables in, in this setup, the euro thing that we talk about is the S matrix. Right, we just send in the free particles, set of free particles, and let them interact and uh, try to detect their the, the product. And the transition amplitude is what we call the S matrix, or the, or, or in other words, the scattering matrix, the scattering amplitudes. And uh, this quantity depend, of course, depends on the momentum and the polarization of these external particles, right? And uh, this is a story. So uh, in analogy with the holography that, that I talked about a, a, few, a few minutes ago, here, uh, when, we, when we try to seek for the holography, perhaps one of the one natural thought is to try, try to see whether uh, this S matrix can as well arise from uh, something that purely lives on the boundary. And here it is from the symmetry point of view, it seems that uh, it's natural to look at this uh, celestial sphere instead of the four boundary of the Minkowski space. Uh, so just give you a little bit more hint. Uh, it, it is well known that if we look at some typical amplitude, for example, the so-called MHA amplitude in the pure gluon theory. And if we carefully choose the variables, which is the so-called spinner helicity variables, the amplitude simply looks, takes this form, no matter how many particles it, uh, it, 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 it involves. And when you look at the denominator, uh, this quantity looks pretty much like some cor conformal correlators living in two dimensions. So this is a very strong hint that there the, the, two side, the two sides should have some connections, right? And in particular, one could also, uh, uh, wonder whether uh, this can indicate the presence of some wall sheet. And indeed, uh, in, in a few decades ago, uh, this motivates people to explore this kind of direction, and uh, it results in the, the, the kind of, the, the class of crystal stream models that people have been uh, very, interested, uh, very interested in, in, the, in, the, recent few day, uh, in the recent few years. Uh, but uh, today, uh, in, in this talk, I'm not going to explore this direction. I would like to explore some, uh, with some different point of view and uh, try to see whether uh, this kind of form can as well imply some proper possible correspondence between the boundary and the bulk, okay? So uh, the goal here, uh, if we, I quote it ambitiously, then uh, we are going to look for some kind of holographic dual description of the quantum gravity, but this time for the asymptotically flat space time. Uh, but of course, this is quite ambitious, and uh, I, I think uh, we, I should say we are quite far from it. Uh, so, uh, a little bit cons uh, conservatively, we could also just as well think, try, to, try to answer whether we could look for some new description just for the S matrix, or whatever kind of uh, S matrix that, you st that you're interested in, in a certain field theory model. Just look for a dual description. And this is uh, the kind of attitude I'm going to take in this talk. And uh, uh, here I would like to mention that in this talk, I'm going to just focus on massless particles. It should also be very interesting to, to check the massive particles, but this is not the, uh, what I'm going to cover here. So let me put uh, uh, first give you a little preliminary uh, information. So uh, I, I think Stephen in some previous talks has already uh, nicely reviewed this uh, this kind of stuff. But here uh, for uh, for later purpose, I'm going to quickly review it again. Uh, so first of all, uh, uh, to 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 bring us to the later story, we would like to introduce some new variables, uh, which is a spin helicity variable but uh, put in a little bit different form. So if we take the momentum, uh, momentum and multiply it by the poly, poly matrix, we can uh, rewrite the momentum information 
into the small matrix together with the variables omega, c, z, and z bar. So the omega parameterize just parameterize the energy of the free uh, massless particle, and the z and z bar are the complex uh, coordinates for the position on the on the celestial sphere, celestial sphere. Or in other words, it, the parameterize in which direction the particles goes in and goes out. Okay, and the c is just a symbol trying to keep uh, keep track of uh, whether the particle is ingoing or outgoing. Uh, so if we strictly stay in Minkowski space-time, then of course the Z and Z bar are conjugate to each other. But here I would like to relax a little bit and think about doing analytically analytic continuation to these variables so we can think of a work in a larger space. Uh, larger space. So just, just treat them as independent. Now, uh, so the target here, uh, as I said previously, uh, when we look at the uh, the set of scattering amplitudes in a certain theory, we would like to see uh, to pursue the possible holography. The first task is to see whether this S matrix can be rewritten into in a certain way so that the uh, the conformal symmetry on the celestial sphere can be manifest. Of course, the scattering amplitude it themselves does not transform nicely under this. Uh, conformal symmetry, and uh, so the first the first target is to see whether we can uh, do a certain change so that we can write them in in a way that transform nicely. Okay. Uh, so oh, the main idea here is to introduce a new set of weight bases. The usual bases that we work with in in talking about the scattering amplitude are just the plane waves, and uh, here, uh, but uh, of course there's we, we are not forbidden to choose something else that we that we like, right? So here uh, we are going to use a set of new bases which will denote uh, with, like v. So on one hand, uh, the of course it of course depends on the uh, the, the the momentum uh, the the space time, but uh, on the other hand we are going to label the bases with the z and z bar and there's a new quantity delta and also some j. The mu is just a Lorentz index. So for example, uh, yeah, so the, the row of the delta and the z and z bar here are just like the row played by the euro momentum in, in the plane waves. And so when we write, out, write down this wave function, of course it, sh it should uh, satisfy the equations of motion. So this is one constraint. And on the other hand, since we have introduced this, these labels, and uh, of course, to the best, we, we would like to uh, we would like we we would like that these new wave functions to transform nicely under the two D conformal transformations. So we think of, think about this z and z bar are exactly coordinates in the two D, and this delta we would like to treat it as a certain. Uh, the formal dimensions and also this J as a spin that we view in 2D. And so uh, apart from the equation of motion, we would like to, uh, uh, in, uh, we would like to impose a new constraint. Uh, in other words, the conformal transformations in the 2D. So it should transform like some conformal quasi primaries. Okay. And if we solve the system, we could see that, uh, this wave function can be expressed in this way. You can ex uh, write it in another form, but uh, uh, in particular, you can write it in as this integral. And the nice, what is nice about this expression is that the integrand here, when you look at it, it's exactly the ordinary wave, trans uh, the ordinary plane wave functions. And so, in other words, this new wave function is just related to the ordinary wave functions by a certain integral transform, transformation. And just remember the pre previous slides, this omega is the energy of the free particle. And so this transformation is just to integrate the energy away and instead introduce this delta uh, from the integration. And this, when you look at it, this is just a standard meaning transformation. And of course, we want this new set of bases to be equivalent to the original uh, set of plane waves, or in 
if this is not true, then we, we are not going to talk, talk about some equip, something equivalent to the scattering amplitude. And so uh, that means when we do this transformation, we also want that this transformation can be inversed. And if you uh, impose this condition, then you can further uh, realize that this delta, these new variables, has to be it has to be picked, uh, chosen with some particular value. It should, uh, at least for the gluons, it should live on the, uh, it should take the values like one plus some uh, purely imaginary part, okay? So this is a requirement from the, uh, from the imposing that the transformation has to, has to have an inversion. Good. Now, uh, so with this with, with, with this in hand, uh, when we then we can work uh, try to figure out uh, what should the scattering amplitude look like with this new wave functions, and due, in particular due to this uh, kind of relation between the new wave functions and the ordinary plane wave functions, uh, we could easily see that the new kind of object that we want to look want to seek for can be just obtained from, an, uh, sorry, a simple transformation from the ordinary scattering amplitude. So this is the amplitude that we talk about, you already talk about, and to obtain a new quantity uh, following from the new wave functions that we talked about, it's, it's sufficient just to take all the energies for every particle, external particle, and to do this many transformation. Okay, so uh, after this, the original energy of the particles goes away, their direction remains, uh, and instead, and in, in addition, there's a new conformal dimension. Something looks like a, like a conformal dimension entering into the new object. And uh, by the definition of these wave functions, uh, it's easy to, to figure out that this new quantity, this new quantity should uh, transform nicely. Uh, under the conformal symmetry that's, in, that's imposed on the 2D, which is parameterized by the Z and Z bar. And so for this reason, we can simply tr treat this new, func new object as some function, as some conformal correlators on the celestial sphere. And this is what we, uh, nowadays, people really call the celestial amplitude, okay? And uh, also, uh, due to this condition imposed by the by by the transformation, uh, we know that this delta cannot pick out arbitrary values, and uh, the value that it can it can take out pick out uh, pick up uh, sort of indicates that we should treat this uh, the the kind of operators entering this correlator to be to live on the unitary principle series. Okay, this is just a uh, from the uh, observation of their uh, conformal dimensions. And so, for example, if you take the gluon amplitude, like the MHG amplitude that we talked about uh, just now, and here I'm, I'm talking about the planar amplitude obtained after doing a color decomposition, okay? And uh, uh, here, one should remember that in the ordinary amplitude, we should also insert in the, uh, uh, momentum conservation delta functions uh, because uh, they, they, they together comes from the ordinary plane waves. And uh, so after doing the transformation, for example, for the three point amplitude uh, with one minus helicity to uh, the second particle also in the minus helicity, but the third particle in this positive helicity, we could, uh, the transformation finally gives us this kind of expression. And uh, from this one, we could also read off the conformal uh, to the conformal dimensions of the each operators entering this function, like this. And uh, one of the universal feature entering into this story is that uh, after doing the transformation, we could always find out a delta function entering into the final expression which uh, sort of puts the constraints on the, on the conformal set of conformal, conformal dimensions of the external particles. And this are actually arise from the, uh, the integration of an overall energy scale. Okay, 
And this is one particular example. And for more examples, for example, you can uh, refer to this the following references. Okay, so uh, by introducing uh, this new new set of wave functions and do the corresponding Manning transformations for whatever uh, scattering amplitude of massless external particles, we can actually always land on the certain object which looks like a conformal correlator on the celestial sphere. Uh, but of course, uh, at the present stage, all we have, what we have are just a set of uh, functions which looks like conformal, trans conformal correlators. But it, are, it's not quite equivalent to the claim that we can, we already have some uh, CFT theory living on the, on the, on the, on the slash of sphere, right? They're, they're not, uh, not exactly the same. And so uh, the next task I would like to explore is to see in what extent can we really treat these functions as coming from a theory, uh, an ordinary, uh, uh, an honest 2D theory. Uh, so what's missing? What, what do we need to further uh, study? So uh, we all know that if uh, a theory is a CFT, then usually we think that this theory should be determined once we know fully its spectrum. Or in other words, what kind of operators it have and what are their conformal dimensions. And uh, also together, uh, we should also know all possible OPE coefficients between any of the three op operators, right? So these are together are called the Euro CFT data. And uh, there are also consistent consistency conditions coming, coming with them, which uh, usually uh, we think that it should be imposed by the crossing symmetry. And also may, perhaps the inherited bonds and, and may, maybe also other conditions. So they together determine what a uh, CFT is. Uh, but here we also we only know a set of functions which are which we think should better be the conformal correlators. But uh, here now the question is: Can we extract uh, the information about the spectrum and also the opaque coefficients from the functions that we have at hand right now? Right. So for example. Uh, when we study the gluon amplitudes, we obtain their corresponding celestial amplitude. Of course, for these conformal correlators, we, it's very tempting to think that there should be some operators, operators in this theory that we call the gluon operator because they are in correspondence to the external gluons we, 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 we insert in the scattering experiment. So at least there should be some uh, operators playing the job as a gluon. And, uh, of course, the, uh, so, so this is at least part of the spectrum. And now, uh, can we at least answer what's, what's the interaction among them in this 2D theory? And uh, if better, can we also uh, find out whether there are even many more operators that we can discover from these correlators and uh, what, how they are consistent with, with, with each other, okay? But one thing which is, seems to be already ready here is the conformal crossing symmetry because we obtain these functions from the scattering amplitude and scattering amplitude already enjoys the cross crossing symmetry so it seems that in this story we uh, we cannot we, we do not need to worry too much about the crossing symmetry here and so it's sufficient that we just take our object and try to directly study what the OPE coefficients are so uh, one way to study this is uh, perhaps uh, an easier way is to uh, grab some uh, uh, some intuitions from the scattering amplitude or some already well-established knowledge. And uh, actually here there is a very nice correspondence which I think Stephen has already uh, reviewed. So just quickly speaking, this, uh, this uh, correspondence is the correspondence between the OPE limit on the on the sphere with the so-called collinear limit for the scattering amplitude. So in the OPA limit, let's think, uh, because here there are the holomorphic variable and the anti-holomorphic variable. So here we just temporarily fix the anti-holomorphic holomorphic one and take, instead take two particles and let their holomorphic variable 
to approach each other. Now, we would like to call this holomorph holomorphic linear OPE language. And uh, when you, this is a picture on the boundary. And if you view it from the bulk, then this configuration just corresponds to the fact that you take two particles and their momenta to be gradually more and more collinear with each other. So in the end, they just shoot, shoot out or shoot in, in the same direction. And so uh, when we study the OPE of two, part, two operators on the boundary, in the bulk, the corresponding bulk picture is just that the two particles uh, approach their collinear limit. And this limit is something well, that is already well, very well studied in the standard amplitude story. So for example, if you take the, again, for simplicity, if we take the amplitude gluon amplitude, and uh, when we study the collinear limit of particle one and two, in particular, we can do some nice transformation, a nice change of variable to their energy, and I write it in this way. And uh, here you can especially uh, figure out that the amplitude factorizes. There is a small factor coming in front, which is the collinear factor. And the, imp the important thing is that the remaining thing is just uh, another amplitude but uh, with one less particles. And uh, the, the picture here is just like, uh, like that the two particles become collinear and effectively, effectively it looks like a single uh, effective gluon. Okay, so if you grab this uh, result and uh, uh, put it into the transform Manning transformation that I talked about a moment ago, you can see that it should be, it's already sufficient that we just treat the uh, integration of the two collinear particles independently. So you can, it's safe to ignore the other uh, Manning transformations but just focus on the many transformation of the two collinear particles. And with the new variables, uh, with the new uh, variables for the energy, you can see that the whole uh, celestial amplitude, celestial amplitude also factorizes. It factorizes into uh, an, another uh, celestial amplitude corresponding to the smaller scattering am amplitude and uh, the, the collinear factor in front just enters into these two integrations. And in the end, it gives, after you do the corresponding integration, it gives you something like this. So in the leading order diverges with uh, Z1 minus Z2. So there is a pole which is uh, in correspondence to the collinear picture because when you approach this, this limit, you also see a divergence, okay? And uh, the, the interesting he thing here is that after you do the integration, you see a beta function. And this sort of looks like the OPE coefficient, right? Because now you take two particles to, be, uh, to approach the OPE limit and you observe a new variable. And here in particular, the, the conformal dimension of the new operator can be actually read from the remaining transformations. In particular, this uh, the exponent of the in this new energy variable. It exactly comes from this, and and so just from doing playing this game, you can you can exactly find out the leading part of the OPE expansion between two uh, gluon operators. Okay, you can both read of the demand conformal dimension of the new operator in the OPE together with the uh, OPE coefficients associated to it. And so you land on this conclusion. So this is uh, uh, the, the way to find out the leading part of the OPE expansion just from the Euro story that we are familiar with in the scattering amplitude, ordinary scattering amplitude, okay? So this is something that you can always do once uh, the scattering amplitude are clear enough. For example, for whatever thing you're interested in, once you know what the scattering amplitude is, you can always play this game and try to find out the corresponding data, okay? Uh, but in this talk, I would like to advertise yet another, uh, perhaps more interesting uh, approach, okay? Which is uh, approach using constraints from symmetries. So the idea behind uh, this game is that uh, of course, we are dealing with some CFT, 
but it's not should not be an arbitrary CFT. Actually, this CFT comes from uh, if it is a CFT, it has to come with a lot of additional structures, in particular structures from additional symmetries. So, for example, uh, when we look back at the scattering amplitude, we all know from the um, uh, the elementary QFT class that uh, the scattering procedure actually does not involve only the Lorentz, Lorentz symmetry, but actually it involves the entire Poincaré symmetry, which actually uh, has four extra symmetries coming from the translational invariants, right? Uh, these are the symmetries in the Minkowski bar. So it's natural to ask what, what, what roles they play in this claim. Uh, when we talk about the 2D conformal symmetry, th this is just isomorphic to the Lorentz symmetry itself. And the presence of the four Poincaré symmetry actually tell us that if we are dealing with some CFT theory here, then this theory should come with some additional symmetries. It should also involve these translations, and these translations should have non-trivial commutations with the conformal symmetry. Okay, so if you try to work out the uh, the action of this additional trans bulk translations from, but this time from the point of view of the celestial sphere, or in other words, uh, if you try to see how these translations act on the celestial amplitude, then you can find out that the generator of this translation actually changes the conformal dimension of your operator. Okay, it shifts the operator uh, conformal dimension by one. So this is one very strong condition that we should take into consideration when we talk about this 2D, 2D story. And another, sorry. Uh, can I ask a question? Your operators uh, yeah. are sitting on the principal series axis. So it's on one plus I lambda. So uh, how is exactly P acting if it's shifting delta to delta plus one? Uh, sorry, can you speak again? Sorry. Uh, your operators O, they were sitting on the principal series represent. They were on the, the principal yeah. series representation, right? So they're yeah. one plus I lambda. And yeah. now here, translations is taking delta to delta plus one. Uh, uh, so right. How should I be thinking about this transformation then? Yeah, very good question. Uh, I have to say I have no answer. <laughs> this is this is something that has caused a. Uh, uh, I, I should say a lot of confusion in us when we are thinking about this these stories, and we still have do not have a very clear expl explanation for how this should be consistent with the fact that the dimension are sort of to be living on the unitary principle series. We we don't have a good answer. Uh, from my 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 own my personal point of view is that uh, perhaps we should. Uh, Think a, think a little bit more about uh, what's the meaning of the principal, unitary principle series here. So originally, as I mentioned, that the, 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 the requirement that they are living on the unitary principle series are just from the, uh, the requirement that the transformation has to be reversible. But uh, my, as I, as I view it personally, I, I think in the end, maybe uh, if we are going to understand correctly about this uh, this two D series, perhaps we should uh, think about doing certain analytic continuation to the conformal dimensions. Uh, maybe in the Euro analog of how we use the unitary principle series in the Euro CFT. So in the Euro CFT, as I understand it personally, uh, the, the way we use this uh, unitary principle series, uh, as practically, it, we, 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 we use them to do uh, a rigorous orthonormal uh, decomposition to, yeah. to a given correlator. But in the end, if we really want to get a sharp understanding of the physics here, we have to switch it, switch back to the high squared representation, right? And the relation between the two are is a certain kind of counter deformation. And uh, actually, I wonder whether there could be some similar things happening here. 
And maybe in the end, uh, the, for example, for this gluon operators or other, whatever other operators we see in this, in this story, maybe uh, physically we should still go back to a certain high square representation. And uh, this unitary principle series are just a certain intermediate stage of uh, in, in, in the procedure of, of how we try to analyze this system. I see. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I not see. quite sure whether I, I made it clear. Uh, this is just my point, personal point of view. And uh, I'm not quite sure whether, I'm not quite sure yet whether this is a correct view to, to do it. But uh, at least I think this, this should be an interesting thing to explore. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah, just let me go on. So this is one very strong constraint coming from the additional symmetries. We, do, we cannot ignore it because we are going to talk about some holographic description to the scattering in the Minkowski bulk. So we have to face it. It's always there. And uh, all the job that we have to do is to uh, figure out exactly what's, what's the consequence of this additional translations. For example, what's the consequence on the physical spectrum? It's actually uh, very interesting to think about. Uh, apart from this, of course, we know that uh, the original idea about this uh, celestial description actually comes tightly uh, with the connection to the soft theorems. And uh, people, many people have, uh, have already studied quite a, lot of, quite a lot about this. And uh, we know from nowadays, we know that these soft theorems are also closely tied to the rest of symmetries at the infinity. For example, for the gauge series, they are tied to the large gauge transformations. And for the gravity, uh, more interestingly, there is a so-called BMS symmetry on the, on, on the boundary. Okay. And here we would like, also like to see whether we can make use of them. Uh, so uh, before I, I, go, I talk about the constraints themselves, let me review a little bit about what kind of structure we can expect for the OPE. And this is from the observation of the Lagrangian. So uh, we already think that uh, in the OPE, there should at least be some operators directly correspond to the particles that we talk about. And so at least uh, there is a certain subcollection of the operators in the OPE, OPE expansion. Uh, and these operators, we can infer them, uh, we can get their information from the presence of this three point vertex vertices in the Lagrangian that we can write down. So every time we see a three point vertex in the Lagrangian, we sh it's very tempting to think that we should write down the corresponding operator for the emerged particle and that there should be a three point coupling, right? And uh, suppose if we write down some effective Lagrangian and, uh, uh, and uh, stare at uh, particular effective vertex, uh, if this vertex has a total dimension, and this, for this dimension, I'm, I'm actually talking about the classical dimension uh, just from a single counting in the Lagrangian. And if this dimension operator has a dimension uh, which I denote as dv, then actually from the if you think a little bit about the scanning amplitude, it's very easy to observe that the new corresponding uh, operator should have a certain dimension, which is related to the original two operators and the dimension of the effective vertex in this way. There's a simple relation between them. And the reason that there is such a relation is simply tied to the fact that we are doing the main transformation and the dimension of the operator is just simply comes to get, comes enters in this uh, factor. So it's just a simple counting of how many power of the energy that enters into the tree level scattering amplitude. Okay, so you can easily get this if this information. And so uh, by taking into consideration these conformal dimensions and the spin, so mo most generally actually you can write down this and such. So you take an arbitrary two, uh, oh, sorry, here this should be two. Uh, the number in the parentheses just denotes the position of the operator. So the one denotes the one and the z bar one, et cetera, okay? So most generally when you take 
the product of two uh, operators that you like, then the OPE, of course, this is not the OPE, but at least uh, this is a sub collection, a subset of the OPE, and this operator should be in correspondence to the uh, kind of particles that you observe, and they are tied to the three point vertex. So for every such vertex, you can write down such term, and they should fit into such a such a form. Okay. So for example, in the Einstein-Yamio theory, we have gluons and gravitons, and uh, in particular, they should involve such interactions, and uh, they they respectively have the dimension four and five. So we can write down the corresponding term. And in particular, in 4D, we do not have any relevant operator which uh, have dv, uh, which is less than four. And uh, when you look at this expression, it in particular tells you that the OPE cannot, invo cannot involve any term which simultaneously have the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic singularity. Okay, so let's be more specific. So suppose we just look at the pure gluon theory. So in other words, we, we for the three-point vertices, we only have this one. And then we can write down, make a non uh, Of course, the gluon operator should be distinguished between the positive helicity and the negative helicity guys. Okay, so we can write down this and such. Here there's the only uh, z one to pole, and we do not have the z bar one to pole. But here we are going to only explore the holomorphic uh, holomorphic OPE limit. Okay, so this is a leading part of the OPE, and there should be other things. Which, but right now we are not interested in them. And uh, here uh, the remaining uh, uh, remaining parameter to be determined are these coefficients, which are here denoted as C and D, in correspondence to the three-point coupling uh, uh, OPE coefficient of these new operators, OK? <clears throat> and uh, here I'm not writing down the O, plus, o minus O minus OPE, because they do not have, have the holomorphic pole, and so they're all regular in Z12. So I'm not writing them down. And so first of all, when you look at the first line, these two operators are the same. And the gluons are all, all, all the particles. And so from both the statistics, the statistics, we can actually easily figure out that this C should be symmetric with, uh, with respect to the exchange between delta one and delta two. Okay, this is one thing that this variable, uh, this coefficient has to obey. And uh, now we are going to see how we can actually fix what the C and D are. Okay. Hi, can I ask some questions? Uh huh. Uh, so going back, so uh, two questions. So firstly, in a standard CFT, when you're thinking of OPEs, the, yeah. the, the reason the left-hand side is symmetric is because there's a, we assume that we're inserting it into radially ordered correlation functions. So there's some ordering which comes from uh, some state operator map. So uh, yeah. in, the celestial, in the celestial CFT, um, uh -huh. Is there any sort of ordering of operators that I should be, uh, because your, assume, your, your symmetry argument come, assumes that the operator product is symmetric. That means, uh, th is there a radial ordering in these celestial, uh, uh, celestial correlators that you're looking at? Let me see. Uh, Uh, I think maybe we, sh we we can we can we leave this to the end? As, sure, sure. Sorry and about just that. Just one more question. So no problem, no problem. One more question about the second OPE. Uh, uh -huh. This you assume this, but does this not? Uh, this is not always true, right? So if I take an anti-holomorphic gluon, anti if I take a negative helicity gluon to be soft, right, to be soft first, yeah. then I'm going to get yeah. a one over z bar one two pole. Yeah. So uh, yeah, your that that that's true. And well, here, well, uh, here is this actually always the issue of the order of limit. And uh, here, 
uh, I think we are taking the attitude that we are going to first take the positive guy to be solved. And okay. uh, I, I also, also previously I mentioned that here we would like to uh, treat the, the two Z bar variables to be fixed for the present to, to avoid the confusion. Okay. I think, by the way, this ordering, this order of limits issue is related to the order of operators issue that I asked you. So the two questions, I think, are related to each other. Uh, but anyway, we can, we can discuss yeah. this for later if you want to continue. Right, right. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, Eris. So I, I, I think this is related to what Prahar is just saying. So the second OP you have derived is, is from the mostly plus uh, MHV. Uh, I mean, from the mostly plus helicity amplitude, right? Yeah. The second. So, but if you had a mostly minus uh, helicity amplitude, then presumably it will be, I mean, O minus O plus should be O plus, right? Because otherwise it will... Uh, I mean, if you take the OP between O plus O minus and it gives you O minus in a mostly negative helicity amplitude, then you will get zero. Uh -huh. with the OP. So I, I think it's related to what maybe Prahar was saying that uh, uh, the O minus O plus OP in a mostly plus helicity will give you O plus, and not O minus, I guess. Uh, well, there I, I think, well, I, I, I tend to agree that the the what you get should be closely related to the kind of uh, the order limit that you take, but I don't think that it should uh, should should matter what kind of op what kind of amplitude you take. I see because if I just use this one, then in the mostly minus, I would get like zero, right? If I took a yeah, but 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 there I I guess there could be some kind of uh, identity between variables that you can use. To observe that if you take this out of limits, you you get what what you expect. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure. I haven't I haven't really checked that, but it's my wondering. Yeah, we, yeah, okay. Well, in one of the previous talks, we had this discussion that even though these OPEs are derived using MHV, I mean, this OPE itself should be insensitive to whether the amplitude they are inserted in is MHV or anti-MHV or anything. Right? I mean, right, right. Uh, so. Okay, thanks, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so, so we are going to see how we can determine this C and D variables. Now, uh, I mentioned the translation, so we can already see what, kind of, what, the, what the constraint it imposes. And so, uh, for, for, to study the, its constraint, it's just suffice to take this open sets and to apply this uh, the, the gener generator of the translation on both sides. And on the left-hand side, of course, it should act on the two O's independently and you get the sum of two uh, terms. And on the right-hand side, you just get a new variable and you expect to get another thing. And uh, if you compare the two sides, you can actually figure out that the, the C and D variable should obey this kind of linear relations. So. Uh, you shift in, in different parts, you, sh you do some shift in the conformal dimensions and there should be a relation connecting them. Okay, this is a constraint from the translations. And uh, in addition, uh, when you, uh, let's also look at the soft theorem. So uh, we previously we mentioned that the soft theorem governs the universal factoring, factorizing structure of the amplitude when you take a certain mass, massless particle to be to to have a vanishing momentum, right? And for the gluons, actually, there are uh, nowadays it is well known that it has both a leading soft theorem and a subleading soft theorem, depending on what kind of order in the soft expansion that you look at. And the first, of, firstly, if you look at the leading soft uh, conformal leading soft theorem, then uh, actually the people have studied previously. And uh, it, it, in particular, in, in our current setup, it can be expressed in terms of the celestial operators. And uh, what you see is that if we take, the, take this product, and uh, in addition, you send one of the, the dimension of one of the operators to, be, to one, this is a so-called conformally soft theorem in corresponding to the original soft theorem. And uh, in, in this limit, you expect that the right-hand side 
to, to, to approach this form. Okay, so there is a poll in, in data one at the value of one. And also uh, the other parts are determined. And so uh, that means that the residue of this poll in C is already also determined to be one. Okay, so you have this additional relation. So this is a, a constraint coming from the leading soft theorem. And uh, in addition, if you look at the subleading soft theorem, uh, it has uh, something, some more to say. Uh, and uh, also uh, to, to code in the current, uh, in, in our current setup, it, uh, the subleading soft theorem just tells you that you, you can do certain action to the operators in the correlation, uh, which is acting this way. And uh, the whole uh, slash or amplitude has to be invariant under this, uh, such actions. And so when you combine this, uh, this action together with the OP, the, our analysis for the OP coefficient, uh, op operator product expansion, it just means that you can do this action, apply this action on both sides and uh, they have to equal. But here, there's a slight annoying part. You see this uh, additional term, which has to do with the Z bar. And uh, when you apply, on, apply it onto the operator, it sort of generates the descendant of this operator. Uh, but here, you, you don't have to really worry about that because it's, uh, it's, when, when, you generate, when it generates such things, actually this term uh, in the end has to compare with uh, with the, with the terms that we did, haven't read out here. Okay, so the OP operator product of course involves the primary and together with all its descendants and maybe also other operators. And uh, when you, when you act, do this action and uh, generate them, you, you can ignore them for the current purpose because they're, they are not relevant for our current study. But still you have to worry about the leading part. And when you do that, you see another Sorry, another set of relations, but this time it, it involves non-trivial uh, contributions from the color factors. And then when you further apply the Jacobi identity to to do the transformations, you can get the, get them off, get, get rid of them, and uh, land on the relation purely on the uh, on the OP coefficients. Okay. So this is a certain kind of recursion relation among the OPE coefficients. So just a little bit summary. Uh, first of all, when you write down the ansatz, at least for the two positive, uh, positive gluons, it, it has a both symmetry. And uh, in addition, we have a constraint from the translation, which imposes a linear constraint. And uh, apart from that, the leading soft theorem tell us that a certain boundary condition for the C function. And uh, in the end, the subleading soft theorem also imposes another uh, constraint. You put all these constraints together and try to solve them, you can find that exactly this set of constraints gives back to you uniquely this uh, beta function that we observe, already observed from the calculation in the collinear limit. So this is a, uh, uh, and a very interesting story that we did uh, just impose the various constraints that we expect that the system enjoys. And uh, we already observed that they can directly give us the correct answer for the OPE coefficients among the gluon operators. Uh, so this is the conclusion for the uh, OPE among the positive gluon operators. Of course, there's also the D function, which also has to do with the negative gluon operator. And here the change is enters in the sub subleading sub theorem. So instead of the previous relation, it impo Im imposes a set of new relation. And you, when you solve the system, you get also the, uh, the OP coefficient correctly. Uh, and next, we also have played with the Einstein gravity, but here you have to make a slightly different ansatz depending on the kind of uh, three-point interaction that you uh, observe in the Lagrangian, okay? Uh, just about the kinematic part. 
uh, as I just remember, as I mentioned previously, the what kind of power arising here depends on the dimension of the interaction vertex that you that you saw. Okay, and uh, the remaining thing is just a numerical function, a, a, a scalar function that depends on the conformal dimensions. The uh, and also the the dimension of the new operator entering here is just determined from the as well from the uh, dimension of the uh, coupling vertex. Uh, the, the, the difference in the graviton, graviton case here is that the subleading soft theorem, uh, as we usually know, actually it corresponds to, already corresponds to the 2D conformal transformations. But here, when we think about the system and the do the many transformation, we have already take, take them into consideration. And so here, this subleading soft theorem theorems actually does not impose any new constraints that help us to determine these coefficients. But uh, very nicely, for the in the graviton case, we we actually know that there's a, also a sub subleading soft theorem, uh, which is sort of analog to the sub subleading soft theorem in the gluon case. And uh, when you translate it into the language of this uh, celestial amplitude, it just tells you that the celestial amplitude has to be invariant under such action. Okay, so you just plug it in uh, very similarly and do the analysis and to pick out the leading part and uh, try to see what kind of constraint it gives you. And uh, after solving the constraint, you get very nicely that uh, the announcer for the OPH coefficients for the for the graviton operators, okay? And uh, of course, you can uh, even do more examples. And for example, you consider the case where uh, graviton and gluons are minimally coupled, coupled to each other and uh, try to analyze. And uh, you also get even more results. So let me, uh, okay. Sorry, one question. Uh -huh. So that's the, like double copy constraints given in your constraints on the OP coefficient, or is it already taking these uh, ratios of, of Z one to bar or Z one to? Uh, uh, sorry, I cannot hear your uh, voice clearly. Oh, sorry. So uh, I'm saying whether the double copy criteria give us new relations, uh, new constraints to write down the OP coefficients, or is it already being taken into account in this ratio Z one to? Uh, here, here, I'm not considering any double copy relations. So here, uh, but we know uh -huh. that the set gravity amplitude is no double copy. Of the yes, right. Yes. So would that give any new constraints? Oh, you mean new constraints from the double copy relations? Yes. Uh, oh, that's a good question. Well, I haven't thought about it. Uh, I'm not quite sure. Uh, my my feeling is that maybe the double copy relations could be uh, any constraints that come from the double copy relations might be already equivalent to some of the constraints that I am talking about here. But of course, it's yeah. interesting to see what how they are equivalent if if the if this really happens. Okay, yeah, it might be in this ratio, said one to one, said one to bar. Uh, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. Uh, my guess is that both here the answer that we write down uh, sort of depends on the dimension of the three point vertex in the Lagrangian. Maybe that already playing some role. Yeah, I'm not sure how to exactly answer your question. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, and I noticed there's a new paper coming out today which talk about some sort of analog of the double copy relations in the celestial amplitude. I, I wonder whether they could uh, have some something that sort of answer your question, maybe. Okay, we'll have a look at yeah. it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it, it might be interesting to have a look. 
Yeah. At least I can I ask, so what is the current associated to the sub-subleading uh, soft theorem on the celestial sphere? I mean, uh, uh -huh. is, that, is that known? I mean, because there is no global symmetry associated to the sub-subleading uh, soft graviton theorem, right? I mean, uh, uh, you see what I mean, the, the, for the, for the sub-leading and leading, we know there is, there is the, the global symmetry is just global translations and global Lorentz. For the leading, uh -huh. the but for the sub sub leading, there is no such. So, I was wondering if the corresponding current is known for the sub sub leading sub graviton theorem. Uh, for, for this, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah, sorry. Uh, just let me quickly draw the conclusion. So, uh, so, so we uh, it is known that the uh, scaring amplitude results a certain representation on the celestial sphere just by doing uh, very simple uh, Mellian transformations for the, at least in the massless particles case. And the result from this uh, new representation is just a set of uh, functions which we very temp it's very tempting for us to treat like the conformal correlators. And uh, it's very inter interesting to explore whether uh, this kind of new rewriting of the scattering amplitude can help us find out certain uh, holographic description, at least for the set of S matrix uh, in the Euro quantum field theory. And uh, the, the, tip, the, the critical question remaining here is that if we really want to find out certain uh, holographic description, it's better, it's with the best to, it is best for us to have a very sharp understanding of the uh, theory content, or in other words, the spectrum and the interactions living in this uh, conformal field theories on the celestial sphere. And here in this talk, uh, I had a very brief dis uh, discussion about how, how, can, how can we determine uh, at least a very restricted set of the OPE coefficients uh, of the uh, external operators uh, uh, by using consideration of the symmetries. And uh, of course, uh, this is a very, very small step. And uh, for the entire theory, uh, there are much more same buried in the spectrum and uh, it's, they wait us for um, a much deeper understanding. And uh, it should be interesting to see whether uh, the, the ideas and the methods we used here can be extended to, 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 the, to to help us to study the other parts of the uh, theory and uh, in the end, help us to fully determine what kind of safety this, it, it really is at least on the celestial sphere. Uh, so for example, some of the, uh, which I personally think should be interesting, some uh, future questions to be looked at. For example, uh, when we think about the spectrum coming out from the, uh, operator product of two external particles. For example, if you think about two gluons, of course it sh should not be sufficient if we just think about the gluons operators it's themselves, or even if you add in the gravitons, there should be many other things. And the uh, one thing that we, uh, I feel uh, particularly attracting is that uh, whether here th there's some similar notion some notions similar to the so-called double trace, triple trace, and multiple trace operators. Because if you think about it, when you, uh, the, each gluon operator takes the color index. And if you really want the crossing symmetry to, to be established in the OPE, OPE product, actually you need some operators that takes multiple uh, color index, or otherwise you cannot make it consistent. And so uh, at higher orders in the OPE product, we have to face such an operator. But uh, I, I think right now it is not quite clear how should we uh, distinguish them and uh, sharply understand their properties in, in this start. Yeah. Uh, and another thing which uh, I've already briefly mentioned in the talk uh, when answering one of the question, fantastic questions is that uh, by requiring that the Mellian transformations to be inversible, uh, people figure out that the dimension, conformal dimensions coming out of the 
transformation has to be set on the unitary, so-called unitary principle series. But right now, uh, uh, I think we, we don't yet have a very good under, understanding of how should we, how should we think about this unitary principle series in this story? Should we really think about this kind of values of the component dimension to be really tied to the physical part, physical operators, or it's just the intermediate stage so that we should think about the spectrum differently? I think this is an important question to be answered concretely. But, but right now, we uh, well, it, it's I think it's an open question. Uh, and uh, certainly, of course, here we are just focusing on the massless particles, and it should be particularly interesting to also uh, have a check of the uh, massless particles. But here, I would like to point out one uh, one one thing that I'm I've been wondering about. So the 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 thing here, the, the question here is actually tied to one of the methods we use, with this uh, collinear limit. So. In the OPE, when we observe the divergence, we, from the box side, it's very clear. When we just talk about the massless particles, the emerged particle coming, uh, coming from the three-point coupling is also a massless particle. So we know that the am amplitude, tree-level amplitude, contains a corresponding massless propagator, and it has to diverge at the collinear limit. But imagine if the particle in the that, that's coupled with the two mass, massless guys are massive, then actually it's not divergent. And in this case, I'm not quite sure, uh, for example, when you think about it, on, think about the corresponding OPE product on the boundary side, whether there's just a, there is a, just a single uh, operators, operator in corresponding to this massive particle, or can we, uh, uh, should we expect to observe something very differently, right? In the case of massless particles from the divergence, it's very tempting to think that there's a single operator. And in the, at least in the case of gluon theory, it's just a gluon operator. But if you think about some more complicated theories, then I think it's no longer quite clear uh, how even at the spectrum level, how the bulk side and the boundary side should be mapped from each other. I think it, it should be very interesting to have a look at such questions. And uh, in particular, we have a well-established object to look at, which is string theory amplitude. And actually, uh, in a, I guess in a previous paper by Stephen and their friends, they have already studied uh, the many transformation of this amplitude. And I think it's very interesting that uh, people have a look at it and try to analyze what kind of spectrum the resulting celestial amplitudes sort of suggest. So this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Uh, Song, are you there? Okay, maybe I can, Song must have stepped out. So any questions for Alice? So I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's related to the comment you made on massive particles. It's slightly uh -huh. related. But I, I, so you have this OPE, which I think the idea is that you would like this OPE such that it can be inserted into any uh, correlation function and you can work out any amplitude. So in particular, I was, uh, what limit would you have to take if I was trying to look at a simultaneous soft limit? So you, 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 you fix your constraints by taking delta one to one. But suppose I take delta one and delta two to one at the same time. Uh -huh. uh, uh, then you see the, the soft theorem is much more complicated. Uh, yeah. And how do we see that from the, uh, and prin in principle, if I have the correct OPE, I should be able to extract that soft theorem also from your OPE. Do you know if that's possible? Uh, oh. Because yeah, then you see you have, you, you, have, you, have, you have poles that are much much more complicated points. You no longer have poles that just Z1 equal to Z2 because the, the, the actual propagator. The, Actually, yeah. I wonder whether that 
can, can that have something to do with the even more complicated operator in the spectrum that we do not yet uh, noticed? I think it would have to. Yeah, because for example, uh, if we take this limit uh, from the farming diagram point of view, now the four point vertex should also matter, right? Even in, just in the gluon theory. In principle, it actually doesn't end up mattering for the leading for the leading simultaneous soft limit. Just the three point vertex matters, but uh, yeah. you end up getting a propagator which is one over p dot p k dot q one plus q two. So that uh -huh. you have this extra propagator. So all the soft limits will only give you propagators of the type one over p k dot q one, one over p k dot q two. So those singularities are nice, simple to handle uh, because both p k and q one mm. are massless momenta. But when I take a simultaneous limit, you end up getting, and this is related to the massive particle kind of discussion that you mentioned. Now you have a, now you have a propagator of the form one over p k dot q one plus q two, and q one plus q two is no longer a massless momentum. It's a mass. I mean, it's a quote right. unquote massive momentum. It does not satisfy q one plus q two squared is not zero. Right, right. So you end up with another pole in some other area, but this this is something that you still get in a pure glue theory. You just need to take in Yang Mills, we still have a non-trivial simultaneous soft limit. So I'm wondering how how would we extract those uh, these type of soft limits? Um, this perhaps perhaps you're right. Perhaps it signals that additional operators have to be introduced. My my feeling uh, is that. Uh, my feeling is that we, we, we this, uh, in, the, in this kind of uh, situation, we, we might need uh, even more operators. Yeah. So even in a pure glue theory, that's your... It, yeah, theory. even in a pure gluon theory. Yeah. For example, if you uh, just think about, think about it, if I, in case I just think about something which only involves quartic couplings, but not cubic couplings, then what kind of what what do we could we expect from the of the expansion? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the the question that you raised should also apply there. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, any, right, right. Any any other questions? So, uh, Alice, I had a question. This is again based uh -huh. on one of the Prahar's initial questions about the meaning of this uh, super translation taking delta to delta plus one. Uh, uh -huh. So, and the, from the bulk perspective, when we apply super translation, uh, we, for example, if we start with Minkowski space time, then we shift it by a soft, uh, soft mode. You know, we basically shift it by like a memory term. So, the, the, the background we get after applying super translation, even though it's flat, it's not. Uh, physically same as the Minkowski uh, space time. Uh, uh -huh. uh, but when you solve the conformal primary wave functions, you, uh, you work with, I guess, Minkowski space time. So I was wondering that if you, your, if your background space time is, you know, not, uh, it's, it's, it's a Minkowski plus one soft graviton mode, would, it, would the corresponding conformal primary wave function solutions change? I mean, would that be a, a way to uh, understand this? Oh. Oh, for this, I'm not sure. I, I think Alok, yeah, you don't I, I need to go to. I think Alok, you don't even need to go to super translations, right? The the issue was already at the level of translations. Yeah, just yeah. normal translations. Ah, okay, that I case, there's, I there's no extra nothing. soft graviton. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not related. Okay, thanks. Yeah, right. Yes, thank you, Praha. Okay. Any any other questions? So Alice, is it fair to say that this is like HKLL in ADS-CFT, like the, the, the framework right now, uh, as you mentioned in the beginning that this is not, I mean, it's not really holography, but like first step in some sense towards the holography. So could I, could well, I say uh, it's like HKLL uh, in ADS? 
Well, uh, at present, I'm not that ambitious. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I should say my my personal view at present is very conservative. It, temporarily, I'm. Uh, well, my my personal view is just I want to uh, figure out what kind of CFT these functions fit into. Yeah, and understand what what it exactly is. But. Uh, I think this is still a little bit different from answering the exact correspondence between bulk and the and the and boundary. It's it's not even far from that. Uh -huh. Yeah. Any any other questions? I don't see any. Okay. If not, let's all unmute and uh, thank Alice for such a nice talk. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.